Hi, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really lucky to be able to have Andrew Thomas Wong with us today. So this is uh, the FIFA, the Festival International du Film sur l'art, and this is the 40th, 40th edition, so really special year for us. And so as part of what I'm doing at FIFA, I curated a selection of music videos. This is the third year that we're doing a specifically a selection of music videos. So this is a really nice occasion to talk with Andrew about um, his path and his contribution to this art form really that has been uh, quite uh, quite monumental in terms of the visual, um, you know, the, the way that Andrew builds worlds is really something unique that has brought a new voice to, um, to this art form. So that's what we're gonna discuss today. Um, and in case you didn't know Andrew, um, I'm gonna introduce him briefly and then we'll, we'll go right into our questions. So um, Andrew Thomas Wong is, known for his visual iconic style. Um, he's a writer and director and crafts hybrid fantasy worlds and mythical dreamscapes. A Grammy nominated music video director, Huang's collaborators include Bjork, FKA Twigs and Tom York among others. His films have been commissioned by and exhibited at the MoMA, the Sydney Opera House and the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA among others. Inspired by his Chinese heritage, queer Asian mythology and folklore, Huang is in late development for his first feature film, Tiger Girl, which has received support from the film Independent, the SF Film, Cine Reach, and the Sundance Institute. Um, so welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're really lucky to count you in. So what I'd like to do is maybe to start kind of at the beginning to kind of build a little bit on the fertile ground on which you're ideas and, and practice has emerged from. So I was interested in kind of the early context. Did you grow up in an artistic family? How did that sort of very early um, background come to, to form the, the practitioner you are today? Yeah, um, great question. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, yeah, um, my mom, I think, always uh, wanted to do art and music, but I don't think, you know, as a daughter of immigrants I don't think she was able to so I think she always encouraged us to do music and and to to do she always supported my my creative life and I also just always had it in me to make things and um I I was really into drawing obsessively um and uh I would make I was like really into puppets. I like was a huge fan of Jim Henson and stuff. So I would just build a lot myself and um, was really just interested in how things work. And so, and then I think eventually realized that I wanted to make films, but I don't think I ever thought of directing as a career. I think I, I wanted to be like one of those people doing animatronics or films or something or like visual effects. And then, um, I had someone advise me that to continue into film, I could study art because that was what I was good at. Um, that I knew I had an entryway into film through art um, as opposed to the other way around. So I studied drawing and painting at USC in, um, in LA and um, helped out on student films and then realized that I wanted to make my own. So that's kind of how I started. Um, making making videos on my computer like 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 we all do now um so i think that uh yeah i but it was really through through fine art and drawing and painting and sculpture and stuff like that that i think i really found it yeah there's something uh that you say in an interview that i read somewhere that i thought was really striking and i think it was someone had that gave you this advice that to fo to focus on the art because the technology will change all the time so um, is that something that is still true for you today and the way that you approach a project? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's true that the technology we use changes so seasonally and you can't use the technology well if you're not, if you don't have like a visual goal in mind. So whenever people ask me how to get into CG or visual effects or digital art, I always say, you know, take traditional drawing and painting classes because that, you know, these are all just tools. Um, I think it's tempting for people to ask what software you use and stuff like that. You can find any of that information on YouTube tutorials and stuff, but what you can't find is 
just the regular practice of learning how to see, mm -hmm. you know, making, making visual artists about how the art of seeing and, and um, observing. So I think that's something that um, I always encourage people to, to practice, yeah, to, to do digital work. And some of those early projects that you were building, um, you were crafting all of these these kind of physical objects and then using a mix of, of that and the digital. And can you tell us a little bit about that? And do you still have some of those props um, around? I think I have some stuff in storage. Um, it's hard to hold on to props because many of them are built to look good for a period of time and then you don't know what to do with them so um, they fall apart but um yeah I mean I think I really I'm really interested in I, I grew up really enjoying movies so I didn't know how the effects were done and I think that's what I like to people keep people guessing um, on the technique and so I think that's why I always try to involve some practical component um I also don't really you know like CG computer generated imagery is not something that I intended to, to go out and do. I think it just became a tool to quickly get out ideas. If I had the money, I would prefer to build these things for real. But I also think that um, also maybe as an introvert, it's easier to kind of draft what I see in my head on the computer than it is to build a physical set, which requires money rallying a crew. I mean, I we still do these, I still do these things. But I think that Um, I, my, my love of practical things is, is because I really do love, I love filming things for real. I love real, um, interactions and, and, uh, you know, I love being on set. I do, I, I prefer it to being stuck in my computer, um, mm -hmm. all over, you know, um, there's so I wanted to talk about your first kind of, or among your first short films that you, Dollface, that was. It came around when YouTube was like pretty new at this time. Maybe it was a couple years old and it yeah. quickly went viral. And um, it was a, you know, very striking, visually striking film. I'm interested in kind of also your relationship to that platform and what that time meant for you in a, in a time where like this, this thing called YouTube where you can share videos, you can do whatever. And so you put out that film and it, and it becomes one of the most viewed and people are like, wow. And what do you think like, about that? Like looking back now, like what does that strike for you? It's funny. Yeah, I feel like it's going to age me because I mean, I still remember like the internet in the OOs was like, we used to like play QuickTime videos in browsers, you know, and have to wait for it to load. And so I remember the first time I saw YouTube, I was like, oh my God, it's like free video, <laughs> like on the internet. And I, and I mostly saw like, know just people being silly filming food thing or like fun and it was all just like silly but I was like oh okay well this is a free distribution platform for me um I think at that time I was much more focused on like I was grateful to I did make like a, a short film I'll never show anybody but it was in high school and my mom was really again my mom is so resourceful and she was like you should send it to film festival and I was like I, I think I was shy, but I think the practice of doing that made me realize in college that that was what I wanted to fixate on. So I was, I kind of had my eye on making shorts for the animation festival circuit. And I was like, well, I can just put this on YouTube when it's done with that, you know, see what, how well it does and then put it online. And then, and then, yeah, when it went viral, it was my first experience with the like interactive responsibility of a maker when your work, if you, if, and when your work ever does catch on, you're suddenly confronted with so much attention and activity that it's really um, quite anxiety inducing. Um, so I think it was my, yeah, it was my first experience like with internet filmmaking Um And it was the thing that started my career because if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have gotten attention from agencies and production companies. Um, JJ Abrams called me like when he saw it and I was 22, just out of college. And I, I was scared out of my mind, you know? So I credit the internet for like helping me get to this place. 
Uh, it really was so new at the time. And this is back when they would feature five videos a week. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then also this was like pre Vimeo, like before Vimeo, right? It was like maybe just a few la years later that Vimeo transformed the indie filmmaking scene and, and um, they had curators that were very in touch with young filmmakers. And, and that's also, we have so many directors that have been born out of that generation too, you know, like the Daniels for instance, or um, so I think that I feel very lucky to be, I guess, to, to, to catch at that time, I guess. Uh, and now the internet is so radically different yeah, it feels like every year it's it's a new space with like new ways of doing things, new tools. And I I wanted to ask you about TikTok towards the end, but maybe this would be a good time to to kind of like get your before we d d dive into your kind of uh, portfolio. Um, how does TikTok sort of factor into filmmaking these days? Because there's all these filters, you can do all these things that used to be, you know, the domain of a, a person who knows how to use pretty complex tools. And now it's a different uh, scenario for anyone. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, each generation becomes even more media fluent. I feel like filmic language established, you know, over a century ago is so we all know it now and young generations know, they instinctively know camera language. And I think it's, I think it's great how much more democratic it is. And I also think it's really interesting that it is a Chinese um, product and the censorship, you know, I, my, my account actually was, was banned. Um, I had, it took me forever to figure out what it was. I, I didn't, you know, you just don't know sometimes what's going to set off the algorithm. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a reminder that these are both our tools that we can use for, cre you know, to amplify ourselves and to be really intimate with each other at the same time these are not our tools mm -hmm. yeah. like we are do we are doing labor for this this entity um so i think it's amazing i think it's both amazing and terrifying and i it makes me feel old <laughs> and uh but i love it i think it's fun i think i think it's also a reminder of like what makes the internet fun you know because i think instagram has become very much a marketplace Mm -hmm. um, all of these tools are, but I think that TikTok almost kind of breathes fresh air for a second into the space where we can just, you know, we have we have room to groom our algorithm uh, again in a different way. <laughs> yeah, it's it so. seems like it's like every you know every new platform exploding becomes this kind of wild space for a while where it's kind of fun and you can grow and you can do all these wild things and then it just becomes a bit more flat like instagram every other post is an ad now and yeah it also changes our sense of our vernacular our vocabulary our like um like there's an instagram sorry there's a there's a tiktok like comedy vocabulary that doesn't translate well in other or like you have people who have been traditionally in the comedy space starting tiktoks and their jokes don't land the same Mm -hmm. you well, know? so I think that it's amazing how radically it's changing our sense of humor, our our the way we actually communicate and think. So it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, and this so this kind of is a nice segue because when you decided to, or when you made the the short film Solipsist, um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you kind of decide to scrap everything and just delete everything you had online and like be like starting fresh because this was going to be the work that you wanted to the world to see at that time. Yeah. So I want to get your sort of input about um, that decision and what that meant for you uh, in that moment um, and how how that became a, a way to present your work into the world. Yeah, you know, I have to say I really have to credit mentors in my life who in my career who gave me tough love you know I think someone that I signed with at a commercial production company they saw it and they were like well is this what you want to do moving forward and I said yes you know because that that again when that film went viral in 2012 it it's the thing that caught Bjork's attention it caught all, you know Tom York all these artists that I admired reached out to me from that one thing and if I had on my reel all the stuff I did prior, like 
lawnmower commercials or like bad music, like mediocre music videos that I did that were not, you know, I was still learning. It wouldn't make me look as strong or, or as mature. So I think what you don't show is as important, if not more important than what you do show. I think um, don't, I, my advice to younger artists is to like, yes, get your hands dirty, make work, but then step back and like only show your best work. If you're only, if, if only one out of your 10 pieces is your best work, just show that one piece. You know, I think that there's a certain amount of ego, surrender, like ego death that's constantly required over one's career to say, okay, um, yes, I'm proud of all these projects. These are my babies, but which one says what I really, which one t like tells people where I really want to go. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to give that up, but I think that, um, yeah, it was a tough choice, but I, one of the, the best pieces of advice I was given and one of the best things I could do to reinvent myself. And I think every artist um, has the opportunity to reinvent yourself after a certain amount of time. But I do think as we get older, that gets harder and harder. Mm -hmm. I think I was in my late 20s when that film, which it, ten, it was 10 years ago. Um, and I was at a time where I could do that. So mm -hmm. um, everyone should ask themselves, it, you know, once you finish your work, where do you want to go next? And what, yeah, what, um, what do you show? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And then, um, so then you start collaborating with Bjork, um, and and then Tom York reaches out as well. And you know, I think you there's something that you said as well, where you said that you know once you gain kind of recognition or you sort of showcase something that's successful, people want you to do it over and over again. Um, yeah. And for you, so on on the one hand what was it like to work with Bjork? And then my, the second part of this question is like, how did you then work with the other artists who wanted you to do the thing that you are, that you became known for? And how did you do it differently than after to try and not always make the same, the same work? Um, yeah. I think this is, this is a great question because I think this is why music videos can be um, such a great way to experiment but they can become a bit of a creative trap if you don't invest in your own work. So like I did my first Bjork video, which was very much inspired by my solipsist piece. But then when Tom York came to me, I wanted to do something very different. And so I pitched something and he, he said, no, 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 do your, do your thing, do your thing. And I was like, <laughs> this might, I'm, I wanna do something very different. He's like, no, do your thing. So he wanted me to bring back that aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And I and I did, but and and I I I I built I kind of riffed on it and evolved it. But the thing is, no one will let you. No one is ever going to let you kind of try that new thing you haven't done before. You always have to kind of claim it for yourself, and then people will see. So I had to take money I was earning on other jobs and reinvest in new work that I wanted to make before people believe that I could do other things. Um, you know, and, and that also came at the cost too of some of the stuff I didn't show. Like one of the first things I ever directed was a narrative heist thriller web series that no one will ever oh. see. Um, but like, I didn't show it cause it was growing pains. It was, you know, but at the same time I, I have directed narrative, I've directed actors yet people kind of knew me for my digital work, you know? So, so you're, yeah, our work is always going to take us on this like conveyor belt and, and usually in a direction we don't necessarily want to go because artists artists are protean. We change all the time. Our interests change. But the economy of art and filmmaking and music are always going to pull us. They're always behind us and they're always going to want us to go in the direction we've already traveled in. Mm -hmm. you know? So you constantly have to reinvest in making new work to challenge yourself and and you know yes um like i was so honored to work with bjork it was one of some it's been some of the best collaborative years of my life um simultaneously like i have to build work on my own voice and not um you know i i need to create a separate uh, garden for my own creative ideas um i think all artists do that's i mean that's that's the the tenuous balance of collaboration 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes you work in a band and you riff off each other and other times you need to continue your own personal development. So, um, yeah. That's really interesting. And um, another thing that stood out to me is that you made the music for, for that first, um, so, the first solipsist. Mm-hmm. And you did that for a number of other works that you, uh, that you've done. And I, kind of was interested in in asking you about your kind of musical process and how that um that works in 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 with with the visual process like how does how do those two things uh coll- like work with each other in in your own work yeah i mean i think i make music videos because i'm such a music fan like there're just so many artists that i love and i think it is music that made me want to make films it's the musicality of filmmaking that I love. And I, I took piano lessons when I was a kid. I, I play more by ear. I don't read music very well. I don't think I'm particularly good, but I'm good enough to like use a MIDI keyboard and mess with it. And I think that when it comes to my own films, usually they're so low budget and usually I may not have the money to pay a composer or to pay an artist that I really love. And, so, and I also think maybe sometimes I just know what I am after. And um, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of compose on my own. I, I use like software that's like so old. It's like Reason from Reason software from like 2003. It's like, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't even use that, but like, but I want to get better at inviting more people in. I think, uh, Composing is its own separate art form, mm-hmm. and I would love to meet to work with more uh, people. It's just, um, again, I'm still kind of going through the process of expanding my own personal work, um, working on my first movie right now. So I'll definitely be asked. I definitely don't have plans to compose my own movie. I would rather get someone better at that than me. Um, so. So yeah, but I, I love music. I love playing it. I, I miss it. I, you know, I, I miss playing music with people. I think it's mm-hmm. one of the best feelings. Yeah. Ever to play music with other people. And for um, your collaboration with FK Twigs, um, I wanted to kind of hear a little bit about that and maybe just more generally about, you know, when you're working with another artist, like, what, how does that conversation or that negotiation happen between both of your visions? And how do you, is it kind of based on the, the person's, how you gel with that person? Or like, how has, how has it happened for you in, in your work? And maybe specifically as an example with FKA Twigs. Yeah, I think Twigs came about in a kind of organic way. I mean, I, I was working with Bjork on the gate which was our last video back in 2017. At that year, I had also done a video for Kalila. um, And I think Twig saw that combo and was like, okay, you know, like, it's cool that you can work with both kinds of both kinds of artists. And so her manager reached out directly. And then the first time I met Twig, she was in the middle of of, uh, finishing mixing um, uh, Magdalene, right? um she was in the she was in the middle of like finishing that album and um and I credit her for just being very open and vulnerable from the get-go like I think that I can't do my work unless the artist is willing to talk to me Mm -hmm. I mean there you have some artists who won't and that's okay you know because we can still make videos without without it needing to be deep But at the same time, um, she was just very forthright and personal and said, I've gone through this crazy stuff the past three years, um, including her health problems, her breakup, um, and she's been learning pole. So she played me the song and, you know, the song is just so emotionally direct. It's very clear what it, that it's a, both a confession and an indictment at the same time. And um knowing her story i knew that we knew that it had to involve pole um and then you know i kind of i just knew that i wanted to tell the story in in the symbolic language that i've developed over the years and for it to be it's it's an emotional song and so the video should be 
an, on, an emotionally honest, but visually um, spectacular psychological journey of, of what she went through. So I, I started dra making drawings and sharing them with her. And um, so I really, again, credit her vulnerability. Um, and same with Bjork, you know, like both of them are quite similar in the way they share and brainstorm and bounce ideas and generate interior narratives. Um, and I like that because I think when people say fantasy, I think sometimes it, the Western inclination is to think of like goblins and castles and stuff like that. Um, but to me, fantasy can be an inner, inner fantasy. Like an, it's, to me, like this kind of imagery is the best way to represent interior experiences. And so I think both Bjork and Twigs um, operate on that level. Uh, we could name countless other art, like Kate Bush, you know, like we have certain icons that are really good at evoking like in interiority with their music. So, um, and then I've had the pleasure of working with people like, um, like Charlie XCX, you know, I did some images from her, for album, like she, Charlie is so, like she's also a genius, genius in her own right, in her very like outwardly, gen, her generosity as an artist is like, you know, it's so fun and it's it doesn't necessarily have to be as um, maybe so uh, like cerebral, but I actually think Charlie's decisions as an artist are incredibly brilliant and very they are they are elevated and i so i think every artist has their own method of how they want to operate and communicate and you know so i, I kind of have i think as as filmmakers who are working with these artists we have to be very like malleable and listen and just react to what the artists want to say and how they want to say it yeah, and I think that this is one thing that really strikes me about your work is that it's it's using this like world building and this and this mythical kind of beautiful worlds to really express like some some interior like way like some emotions as you say kind of like the the interior world of someone. It doesn't have to be like space exploration. It's like just it's what you have inside that just comes out in this absolutely gorgeous, uh, fantastical world and. Um, um, and I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about how you how that um, the kiss of the rabbit god from a couple of years ago, 2019, more than a couple, um, how that maybe represented a different way to do that. And what um, how personal is that film and how did you sort of what, what was the significance of it in terms of your trajectory and how you explore your ideas um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, in 20, like 17, 18, I started, I think I, like once I had finished that video with Bjork, I felt like I need to make my movie. And I, I had written some things years prior, but I don't think I was mature enough until that point to really think, okay, like, what do I, I think I was hoping to find screenwriters to, that I would gel with, but I think I just had to like learn how to write myself like no one was going to write material for me that I, so I think I started writing in 2015 or 16. I mean, this, this stuff happens in layers, you know, like I was writing a bit. I couldn't, I had written a few screenplays, but like didn't, because all my stuff is so fantasy, everything I write, it just tends to be kind of expensive. And it's just been very hard to find that story. And I knew that in tandem with writing a feature, I need to make work that is narrative to, to move me away from like just the music video world. Because also a lot of my music video heroes, um, you know, if they don't move on to do other narrative work, it, it music videos, they, they move with the economy of music, which is so fast and quickly, if you don't uh, adapt, you, you like your career kind of stagnates. And so I really needed to say, figure out what I wanted to say and, um, Nowness had asked if I wanted to participate in this um, program they had called Define. So the year before that, they did Define Beauty. And then this that year, they were going to do Define Sex. So they were like, tell a story about 
a queer Asian experience. And at first I was like, oh no, that's like so personal. I don't know if I can do that, you know, but then I was like, well, maybe I can, but I don't want it to just be like a love story. It's like, it needs to be something more than that. And so, yeah, it's been like a year of writing it. I also was in um, what's called the Sin Reach Fellowship. They're a nonprofit that focuses, that supports independent filmmakers. And so I developed the story there, um, got a grant from them and used that to fund this short. And I think it really was a way of sh like just pivoting and saying like, I want to do more narrative and I want it to be personal. And um, it was very scary to be honest, to do a piece that personal. Um, I think music videos, for many filmmakers, we can hide behind the style and the flair of working with this cool artist, but like to truly just say what you want to say on your own um, and make it, uh, you know, this was really confessional for me. And um, I had a moment too when we were filming it and I felt like kind of, we were filming, the, the end of the film is a sex scene but it's shown in this symbolic way and it's shot almost like a music video. In fact, people always say, oh, I thought this was a music video. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, we were filming it and I was like so scared because I was like, why is it like, I, I felt like, oh no, is what I'm, is what I'm doing stupid? And is it, is it cheesy? And like, I was like, well, I can put all these other artists and, crazy clothes and funny lights and make them look amazing. Why can't I do that for, for my own people? You know, why can't I put people like on screen that look like me and make them look elevated? And so it was a moment where I had to just do it, even though I had my own reservations. And even still the movie, you know, the movie was my first time dipping back into narrative in, in many years. Um, so it was a good exercise in being vulnerable and um, using the language that I had cultivated um, over the years for my own story. And I gotta say, like, cause I did cellophane, I think we shot it just after we shot my short. And yet I would say cellophane was it was frankly easier for me to handle. Like I had done work like this prior with Bjork, working with Twigs was, she, Twigs also makes it very easy because Twigs is a genius. I'd say that was, um, I'm very proud of both pieces, but making Rabbit God was so much more emotionally taxing um, and also technically challenging on how to tell a world that felt just as expansive, but, is set more in this world with with Asian characters, with dialogue. It's so much harder, I think, um, for for me at that time, to to ex execute that. So, you know, I think um, projects shouldn't always be measured by their budget or what star is attached, or you know, they they they're kind of measured in how you grow. Um, and and how it changes you by the time it's over. That, and that budget could be just a few thousand dollars. It could be two hundred thousand. Doesn't really matter. Um, work work is it's about how much that work like how much it really cuts you inside to make it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And has um, has imposter syndrome ever been something that you've struggled with throughout this uh, this trajectory? And how have you found ways to overcome it? Um, no, that's a good question. I mean, short answer is absolutely. I mean, when I, again, when, when, when I was first approached to direct just after college, I was felt very much like, oh no, like I don't see someone like me doing that. You know, to me, it was some bearded guy that looks like, Peter Jackson or something sitting in a chair, you know, like I was like, no, I didn't, I can't do, I also felt, I felt so shy and I still do, you know, even the first time I was on set, I felt so diminutive, you know, compared to the crew. And it's amazing over the years to see how much more um, diversity there is, you know, now um, that we're fighting for still on, on film set shoots. I mean, the truth is there's still so much work to do. Um, 
we have a long way to go, but I think that, um, how do I deal with it? I mean, <sighs> therapy and also, mm, there's a certain point at which you just like, you just have to make something and finish it. And then if, if, there's so much fear that goes into releasing a project to, you know, all the rest, you can't control the response you're going to get. But I think you have to really own your, you, you have to like own your failures, you know, and just keep going. It does take a lot of trickery. It takes a lot of mental trickery, <laughs> you know, um, and you need the right community to people that uplift you. And you have to say, yeah, like I have, I have, I think it, there's still so much work to be done for so many of us um, who are underrepresented in film and in all the arts to say, like, I can inhabit this space too, you know, that, that, um, and then, and then if you do, how do you transform it? Because it can't be the same as what's come before us. There's different stories to tell, like, um, especially in the US, you know, like Asian filmmakers can't just replace like these these our characters and our faces are not just interchangeable we have to tell stories that are specific to our communities um so yeah i don't know um i think that that there's just a lot of work to be done and i i, I do think therapy is should be a human right <laughs> and i think it's you know it takes so much emotional resolve to have the courage to make any art at all and to make art that's brave. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's a really nice segue into your first feature film that you've been working on. I mean, there was COVID happened at the, and at some point in the process, but um, tell me, tell us about it and where you're at with it and how it's evolved over the past few years. And um, hopefully we can see it somewhere. Um, tell us yep. about this project. So the film is called Tiger Girl. Um, it's about a Chinatown girl in the 1960s who's haunted by a tiger in her attic. Um, it's a coming of age fantasy. Um, and uh, it is something that came, it was inspired by my mom when she was a child. Uh, my grandmother told her there was a tiger in the closet that would eat her if she was bad. And so I thought that was very specific. And I had this image in my head of a tiger in the house um, haunting this girl and um, I've had the idea for many many years but I didn't quite formulate it into a story and I started writing it in 2015 I had to put it away because I just my write I just hate you know writing was just so painful and I I felt like I needed to make it a present day story for budget but then I was like no it really should be set back then because I haven't seen Asian American stories told back then um, and so I just kept writing it. I did the film independent labs, the Sundance labs, um, SF film um, workshop. So I've kind of, I realized too that like, in order to make narrative film, it's a different community. And I think that the music video community, the music video, commercial, film, TV, all these communities like go like this, you know, they all kind of overlap, but they don't quite, each industry has its head in the, in the sand. And I think that you have film people who are really missing out on such talented music video directors. Um, but then I also think you have music video directors who are so caught up in the rhythm of the music industry, which drives it, that we don't have time to stop and think about what stories we want to tell. We don't have the tools. So it's like both communities kind of need each other. And if you can live somewhere in the middle, like Spike Jones, Michelle Gondry, all these great, art, you know, people that had that ability to, then I think you've got the best of both worlds because music videos really train you in craft. But film is, you know, we, it's a, I, I had to change my community and, and do these labs and stuff to meet new people and talk, who I, with whom I can talk about this longer script. So uh, mm -hmm. anyways, sorry, I, I derailed a bit, but the movie is, um, I mean, 
I've finished my 10th draft over almost a year and a half ago. Um, we've been financing. Um, the pandemic definitely put a pause on things. I shot three proof of concepts. One of them is public. It's a short film I called uh, I made called Lily Chan and the Doom Girls. I actually financed that by doing um, like a, it was like a Google ad where we had to shoot something on their phone. So I just shot a scene from the movie on the phone um, just to, and, and so like, and I have other pieces that I've shot that we can't show because they were part of a lab and I just, it's not ready to be public, but I think it's all been exercises in realizing this and, our plan is to shoot this summer um, where we're cast our leads. Um, I don't want to jinx it yet, but we do have a very exciting financing offer in play. And um, so it's like, you know, I it's, this is continues to be an education for me um, on what it takes to really make a movie, why movies are, it's just so it's just such a slow slower pace than what I'm used to in the music video world. Music videos mm -hmm. are so immediate, and uh, so it's been a lesson in patience, a lesson in finding a story that is truly worth this amount of time. You know, and mm -hmm. um, another lesson in vulnerability for sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's really great. Thanks for sharing all those pieces because I think that's that the way you straddle those those worlds is really, really unique and interesting. Um, and how you kind of, as a creator, how you can continue to, to make things interesting for yourself and find the things you want to say and not kind of become boxed into a, a type of filmmaking. And that's really something that you do really inspiringly. And uh, I think a lot of people, if there's people watching this who want to get into this, uh, I think that's really inspiring. And, and the ways that you kind of describe the different points where you can access like the people involved and the, the ideas, the financing, all these different pieces that need to happen, you know, and how it all, of course, stems from the art and the ideas that are at the source of things. So um, thanks for your generosity in, uh, in kind of sharing all of this with us. And uh, we're really, very excited to see this film. Are you going to make any music videos in the future or is that kind of something you're putting on a pause for now? You know, I got to say it's harder and harder for me to make videos, um, especially after cellophane, because it's hard to top that. I, you know, it's funny. I did do a music video in 2020, uh, but unfortunately um, the artist decided not to release it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that was also kind of a moment where, a uh, short answer is I will make more music videos. It just has to be the right fit and the right time. But there's so many artists that I would love to make videos for and so much I still want to do in that space. So well, short answer is yes. I think that, uh, you know, but this film, you know, does take the majority of my attention. And um, so, you know, when the right time uh, ha comes, uh, I'll definitely be back at it. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's been it's been really wonderful to talk to you. Uh, thanks for um, being so uh, so generous with us, and uh, I'm sure everyone here looks is looking forward to to your work. So um, thank you, and good luck with the film. We're looking forward to it, and uh, thanks for your thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you.